Well, John, it is a privilege to be doing the podcast with you. We have been friends for many years. You and my parents were able to connect and uh, you stayed at our family's house. I've stayed at your house in Nashville and um, been friends with your kids and just known you for many, many years. And so, first of all, thank you for joining us and being here. The honor is mine to be here. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Logan, and I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Yeah, you're a very smart young man. Well, I do what I can, and uh, I'm grateful to learn from people like you and people like my dad who uh, just are some of the most genuine leaders. And, and truly, I, th I think that that's something that I've been inspired by you is just the genuineness as we've gotten to know each other, as we've done ministry together, as you've been here at River Valley many times over the last decade, really every year you can be here, um, just being authentic and genuine and uh, not afraid to speak the truth, but you're you're right. you're real on both <clears throat> sides of the green room to say that's really important to me, um, because you know I learned very early on. Um, I served in my local church for four years, and I picked up all the guest speakers. And um, I'll never forget, I, I was conflicted the first year I worked, and I mean this is forty years ago. I would watch guys come in and. As I drove them to the service, I feel like I was going to a concert. Sure. And then I'd watch them get up on the platform, and I'd see people get out of wheelchairs. I mean, this is real. And I was so confused because my heart was like, something's wrong. My head was going, shut up. Do you see what God's doing through this man? And it took about a year, and one day God spoke to me, and he said, I brought you here not only to see what to do, but to learn what not to do. Mm. He said, what you see in your heart that you know is wrong, file it. And when you enter ministry one day, don't do it, but don't judge them. Hmm. They're my servants. And that really freed me up to be able to honestly assess, okay, one day when I'm a leader, I'm not going to do that. And I, I do believe that it is so important that we, like, my, you, you know what my number one ministry goal is? Number one. Number one. This tops all of them that I will be more in love with Jesus the day I leave this earth than the day I started ministry. Because mm. I've seen too many people that they started out on fire and they ended up either in sin or they ended up cynical or jaded or just absolutely lost their passion. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to me. And to remain that way, you have to live from the inside. So... In other words, when I'm in a hotel room by myself, when I'm at home with my family, I gotta, I'm gotta. i going to live exactly the way I live on the platform. Mm -hmm. I'm not living any different. There's not a different John Bevere. There's not duplicy. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that's really important. And because, I mean, do you realize there's a multitude of people? They're going to look at Jesus and call him Lord, say, we, we did all these great things in your name. We preached messages. We got people free. And he's going to say, I don't even know who you are. Depart from me. And and so they arrived the, at the pinnacle of what everybody thought was success in ministry. But in reality, they didn't really know God. When you know God, you're going to live <clears throat> the same no matter where you are. Because you know <clears throat> the leaders of Israel, when you look at what they used to say, they'd say, the Lord doesn't see us. Ezekiel wrote this. In Ezekiel chapter 9, he said, the Lord said, do you see what the leaders of Israel are saying? The Lord doesn't see us. Can you believe that they, somebody ever gets that? Now, now, obviously, if you looked at those leaders and said, does God see everything? Oh, yeah, he sees everything. But deep somewhere in their subconscious, they had this attitude of, I can hide things from God like I can hide things from everybody else. Hmm. And that's what a lack of the fear of God does. When we lose sight of the awesomeness of God, we really lose sight of it realistically in here, in our core. All of a sudden now we're going to believe we can do things in the shadows and him not see it. Or maybe he's too busy to notice what we're doing, thinking, saying. <clears throat> no. In, in so many of your books, you're, you share authentically some of the struggles that you had early on in ministry. And you know, you've been open about whether it be killing kryptonite or in bait of Satan or you know, even sharing this weekend with us the unforgiveness that you carried, you know, 30 plus years ago, as you've now seen that freedom of, from those things, what are some of those warning signs that, you know, you see even, you know, coming up on 40 years of ministry that are kind of warning signs for you to say, okay, 
This is me trying to go back to the old John or the person who is unfor- ungrateful or the person who is struggling with that temptation. Because I think for a lot of pastors, we're, oh, we're in a good spot, but how do we avoid going back to the things that we that used to hold us? You know, God's given us a gift, Logan, and that gift is called a conscience. <clears throat> I'll, I'll never, ever forget. I'd only been in ministry a few years, and I'm at lunch. I just published, you know, my third book. Um, I think at 35 years old at the time. I met lunch with a guy who had an international ministry. He had been in ministry longer than I'd been saved. And we're having this lunch. And he looks at me and he goes, John, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, "Uh, how do I keep from falling like other guys have fallen? And I almost choked on my chicken, Logan. I'm like, I should be asking you this question. You shouldn't be asking me this question. But rather than be stupid, I looked inside (laughs) and I just said, Holy Spirit, I don't even know how to answer this. And the Holy Spirit said, tell him to never go against his conscience. And so I said it. And then when I said it, it started rolling out of me. I said, you know, you're going to be offered opportunities that look really good, that really will propel your ministry. But inside, in your conscience, you know you're you're compromising Hmm. a certain element of integrity. I said, listen to your conscience. And I go back from this lunch, and I start reading my Bible, and all of a sudden I started knowing it's conscience, 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 conscience. Well, now I'm doing a word study on it, and I find out it's over 30 times in the New Testament. Do you know what Paul writes? The very last letter he writes on earth, right before he's beheaded, he says to Timothy in the very first chapter, I thank God who I'm, who I, whom I've served with a pure conscience. Mm. So now let's talk about a conscience. Our conscience is what keeps us connected to God. You can sear your conscience. Okay? Now I want you to stop and think about searing. When we sear meat on the grill, what do we do? Burn it really quick on the outside so all the juices get locked in, Right? What happens if you sear your flesh with a very hot iron? You lose feeling. So think about it. All the juices, which would be the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, what's needed for the moment, gets locked inside. And you are past feeling. Because the Bible talks about being past feeling, right? So I'll give you an example of how we can sear our conscience. I'm going to give you the process of how you sear your conscience. So... You're in a group, and you talk about some pastor, right? We're all, we're all leaders here. Let's just be honest. You're having the green room talk. Mm-hmm. You're at lunch, <clears throat> and somebody says something about it, another well-known pastor. Usually, It's usually a pastor w- more well-known than any of you around the table. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so, it, don't you feel like we feel like because they're more well-known, they can take this cheap shot or something? like? We got to bring them down to our level. <laughs> I mean, this. I'm not saying I do that. I'm saying this is the mentality. No, you're right. Yeah. So, you say something said about a pastor, and you say it, and 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 all of a sudden you feel like this knife hits you right in your gut. That's your conscience, and you justify. You justify by saying, "What I said is true. It's accurate." So you ignore the knife, and you justify what you just said by the fact that it's accurate. So what happens? A veil goes over your heart. Okay? So now the next time you're in another lunch and you say something about a pastor, any other pastor, you don't feel a knife now. You feel a pinch. But you go, but what I said is right, and you ignore your conscience. Hmm. Another veil goes over your heart. So the next time you say something about somebody, you don't feel a pinch. You feel a tingle. And you go, I'm right. Another veil goes over your heart. Next time, you don't feel anything. Your conscience is past feeling. Mm. You are in a very dangerous place, and only repentance is going to get that back. I remember there's a, there's a man who has a massive ministry in a nation, and he has the second largest ministry in the nation. And the other pastor had, a, there's another pastor who had the largest ministry in the nation. And we were, at, we were at lunch, and he started saying something about that other pastor who was bigger. 
And I just stopped him and I said, hey, I, 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 I got to guard my heart here. And my, my ears can't become garbage pails. I, I can't have you talk like this. Mm. I, I just, I, 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 I'm sorry. He's not here to defend himself. If he was, I'd be okay with bringing it up. You're concerned, but it's just, you don't need to be saying this. Well, you know, I had no idea. I just, just off the cuff, right? Every time he introduced me to his conference with 9,000 people in it, like the next couple of years, he said, you know, I love John. It's because I was talking bad about a pastor and he stopped me and said, my ears aren't garbage pails. Hmm. And that's how he introduced me. And I, and I realized all of a sudden, hey, we're all pastors here. We need to hold each other accountable. Yeah. Let's, let's be each other's friends. You know, now, now granted, if somebody is so eaten up with pride and you say something like that, they're not going to respond like that one pastor did with me. They're going to get really angry. You yeah. know, King Uzziah got angry. Mm-hmm. He broke out with leprosy. Leprosy is an outward. All the, all the citizens in Judah were going, oh my gosh, our king's got leprosy, right? <laughs> yeah. But God gave us the inside scoop. His, scoop. His heart was lifted up. And God spoke to me one day and he said, son, pastors that have fallen, he said, you see the leprosy, you see what happens on the outside. He said, they don't have a hormone problem. They have a pride problem. So that's what we have to guard our heart against. And when you listen to your conscience, God will protect you from pride. So it's really important. One one thing that I I feel is a huge area that, that people are struggling in, maybe it's more so younger pastors than older, but you just talked about it, speaking the truth. Yep. You spoke the truth to somebody that invited you, that asked you to speak. You know, I think there's a lot of people that would just say, well, you know, even though I disagree with them, even though they, you know, I, I want to speak up, I'm their guest, you know, I want to honor them, but you weren't afraid to do that. I, I feel that whenever you come to River Valley, the sermons you bring, they're not fluffy, they're not feel good. They are truth. They're they're you know talking about this is going to kill you. And w- what is there something in your life that that really like woke you up to that? Did it take you a while to be as bold as you are from the platform? Yeah, yeah, there was something that happened. Um, so when I was in my church serving for four and a half years, taking care of all those guest speakers and everything, right? Um, back in those days, I hated confrontation like a deadly disease. I mean, like. Oh my gosh, I hated confrontation. <laughs> so I was the guy that would always say something encouraging, kind, um, something good about somebody, even if it wasn't true, Logan. <laughs> I would just say it, right? And I, I got this reputation in my church because we had 450 paid staff members. Wow. Okay? And <clears throat> it started getting back to my ear through the grapevine People were saying, John Bevere is one of the most loving guys in the church. He is just so encouraging, right? So I was, I was really happy about it. And um, I'm in prayer one day, and the Holy Spirit said to me, people are saying that you're a very loving, kind man, aren't they? And I remember when he said it to me, I thought, he's not affirming me. <laughs> I, I thought this. I thought, he's not affirming me. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about where this is going. I, 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 just in that incident, I, and so I, so, so I cautiously said, yeah, people say that. He said, do you want to know why everybody says you're so kind and that you're so loving and that you only say something positive to people? He said, do you want to know why you do that? I said, why? He said, because you fear their rejection. He said, so who's the focus of your love, you or them? Wow. I said, I guess I would be. He said, yeah, if you really love people, you would tell them the truth, even if you thought they might reject you. So, I mean, that changed my life. Yeah. Now, I will say this. I swung the pendulum. Now I, I started filleting people, <laughs> okay? And, 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 Turn and, and oh, burn. my yeah. gosh, it was terrible. And I remember I actually was young. I was now... Not in that position anymore. I just started Messenger International. I finally got invited to do this big conference in Europe with internationally known speakers. And I remember after the conference, um, word came to me from three different continents that I was beating the sheep. Wow. Three continents. (laughs) And I, (laughs) I remember I went to God and I said, God, 
I need, com- I need compassion. Mm. I need compassion. And for four months, I went to my basement and prayed. Every day I was home, I went to my basement and cried out and said, God, please give me more compassion for your people. And I learned something in that four months. And you know what I learned? A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. <laughs> you ever hear somebody say, don't ca- candy coat the message? I disagree. Candy coat it as much as you can. Because if I candy coat arsenic, it's still going to kill a person. Sure. If I candy coat a vitamin, it's still going to benefit the person. Mm-hmm. Okay. What do you mean by like candy coat? Can you give us like an example? So I think some people are going to take that and go, well, you know. Yeah, that was an old saying. Is, oh, he just sugarcoats his messages, sure. right? And I'm like, you should sugarcoat it because a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Remember mm-hmm. that song? Yeah, yeah. From, from The Sound of Music, right? Mm-hmm. And so I realized that a message can be just as powerful, just as confrontive, just as life changing, but bring some, mm-hmm. bring some candy into it, yeah. bring some sugar into yeah. it. In other words, make it fun a little bit, right? Yeah. And, and so that, that helped bring the pendulum back to where hopefully now, you know, I do realize there's times that, there's times, and I will be honest with you, I can't can- candy coat. Sure. It's su- such a serious matter. I've got to be very bold and direct, and I've got to say it in a way that kind of puts a little f- healthy fear into the person, mm-hmm. okay? Because healthy fear is good. I mean, you walk out and, and, and you have, you, you know, everybody's like, no fear, no fear, no fear. Okay, go out and go pet a, a lion in the wild. You know, go jump off a 3,000 foot cliff. W- 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 there's a healthy fear that says, I'm not jumping off that 3,000 foot cliff. Mm-hmm. There's a healthy fear that says, I'm not going to go pet that cobra snake, okay? Yeah. So, so there is times to put a healthy, godly fear into people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes you can't sugarcoat it. Yeah. Is that Mary Poppins or Sound of Music? That was Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins. Sound of Music, yes. Uh, yeah. I was like, both <clears throat> Julie Andrews, but um, how, do you, how have you learned to have grace with yourself? Because you talk about your pendulum swings. I think as a leader, I've learned that me five years ago, I'm like, ah, I wish I would have known this now. And I'm sure throughout your ministry, you've learned things time after time of ways that you've grown. How, how have you learned to have grace with yourself as you grow in ministry? I've understood that God is an extremely merciful God. So if He's extremely merciful, there's one thing that's very important to me, that I get the lesson. Mm. I get the truth. Wow, yeah. And um, there are times that were... I prayed something. Let's put it this way. I prayed something when I was young in ministry that I'm still amazed that I had that much wisdom to pray it. So it must have been the wisdom of God because I was I was stupid when I prayed it. Okay, but I prayed one day and I and, and I tell my I told all four of my sons to pray this prayer. I prayed and I said, God, never allow this ministry to grow beyond the character that you have developed in me. Mm. One of the smartest things I've ever prayed in my life. And I'll tell you, I didn't realize the pain that I would be su- signing up for. Okay, so sure. So I'm I'm going to give you an example. Um, I was. Doing a conference, one uh, one one conference. I can't remember how many years ago this was. This is a long time ago, and I remember now. Now, when I when I get up to preach, I usually go with what I feel the Lord wants me to do. I don't hear actually the Lord say, "I want you to preach on this." Right? Only a few times in my life has God said to me, "I want you to preach this." Well, I went to this conference and I heard the Lord say, I want you to preach on the bait of Satan at this conference. Now, people had come from all over for this conference. They had, there were people that had driven four hours. The conference, you're right. And, 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 and I remember I go into the green room before the service and they're like, oh my gosh, people have driven from everywhere to hear you, right? And I'm really struggling, Logan, because I had written five books since the bait of Satan and the bait of Satan was already a bestseller. And I thought, oh gosh, these people are driving four hours. They've read the bait of Satan. They don't yeah. want me preaching on the bait of Satan. They give them the fresh stuff. I, yeah. I want to give them, because I was writing a book at that time. And I thought, man, it was really burning in me, right? So I'm, I'm conflicted. So I go out, I go out into the service and, and, and the atmosphere is electric, right? And so what do I do? I get up and I give in and I preach what I'm writing on right now. Yeah. And I mean, Logan, Oh my gosh, the, the people were standing and like, like I'd say something and people would stand up and they'd cross their arms like, you know, you know, just, just so excited. Yeah. They were like, yeah, right. 
And, and so their service, and it was amazing, right? Service, strong anointing. Go back to the green room. Everybody's excited, right? Next morning I wake up, I feel like I'm going to die. There is a heaviness on me that I feel like is going to kill me. And I remember that morning, I rolled straight to my knees in that hotel room. And I said, God, I didn't obey you last night, did I? He went, no, you didn't. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Please forgive me. So I get ready. I go to the airport. I feel like, oh, my gosh, this heaviness is getting worse. It's like, I mean, the pain that came with the heaviness was unreal. I, the flight's delayed. I'm walking around this airport just feeling like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? I feel so heavy. So get on the plane. I fly to the West Coast. It's a three-hour flight, right? I, I, I'm on this plane, and I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I mean, it's just the pain. We circle the city of San Diego, and the pain lifts off me like a bird. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, this is a new city. Now obey me. Hmm. And I remember on that plane, I said in my head, I said, God, I repented this morning. And that was two time zones ago. I've gone this entire day feeling like I was going to die. Why did you, why didn't this pain lift off of me when I prayed this morning when I said, I'm sorry? And the Holy Spirit said this to me. He said, because I wanted you to know how serious your disobedience was to me last night. There was a pastor in that conference who needed to hear what I entrusted you on the bait of Satan, and he didn't get it. Hmm. Now, you know what's amazing, Logan? At the judgment seat of Christ, all those people that loved what I preached at that service that night, all those people thought I obeyed God. Hmm. They said the service was amazing. Do you know they're all going to find out the judgment seat, that I disobeyed God, and I'm going to have to look at that pastor and apologize to him in front of the assembly of heaven, because nothing hidden will not be revealed. Was I forgiven? Yes, I was forgiven. But you know, David was forgiven. But he still had issues to deal with from his sin. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you know, um, when you understand this, you, you handle ministry a lot differently. I think that's such a huge lesson for all of us to learn. Obviously, you learned it by God speaking it to you in a plane, but... When you look around, you have the privilege to have a global view. Uh, I mean, you have a global view of the church. I think that's what connects you and my dad so much, is you both see the church not as just the Church of America, but the Church of the World. Your dad's an amazing man. He is. He is. Um, what What do you feel, you know, from your, your opportunity to travel, both domestically and globally, what do you feel is maybe some things that pastors are maybe hesitant to be obedient on? Obviously, every, I'm not putting you in the seat of God, but you you have a view that maybe others don't as somebody who goes from church to church, weekend to weekend. I think we've all fought the same thing. And the, the thing that pastors fight against is, let's just face it, we have, we have the world's view of success constantly put before us. Hmm. And the world's view of success is having butts in seats. How big is my church? How big is my ministry? You have to come to the place where what you're after is the pleasure of God, God smiling on the inside of you after you've preached, rather than the pain that I said. You know, I've, I've walked away. There's times I've missed God. I've said something wrong. I've, I've, I've mishandled what I was entrusted with, and I didn't have that smile. Now, I can leave a city and everybody be upset with me, and if I got that smile, that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So I have to sit there and go, what is my definition of success? You know, there's a statement in John's Gospel that says there was a man sent by God whose name was John, and that was John the Baptist. And you know what the angel Gabriel said about that man? The angel Gabriel, go read it in the book of Luke. He shall be great in the sight of God. Logan, it's one thing to be great in the sight of people. It's a totally different thing to be great in the sight of God. And when I saw that scripture as a young man in my 20s, 
I said, God, I want to be great in your sight. I don't want to be great in, in people's sight. I want to be great in your sight. I mean, think about that. Would you, would you just stop and think about that? Great in the sight of God? I mean, that's, that's mind-blowing. Yet it's attainable. Because God's no respecter of persons. So I'm telling you, Logan, in my 40 years, four decades of ministry, I have met people that are great in the sight of men. But I wonder if they're great in the sight of God. And I've met people that are great in the sight of God. But they're not very great in the sight of men. And I just think every young man and every young woman, every pastor, every leader has to say, what's my definition of success? Is it being great in the sight of people or great in the sight of God? Well, well, I think that's a question that people can chew on for a while. And yeah. I know that that's one that you've had to ask yourself and you've led. And uh, I just want to say thank you because I couldn't think of a better way to end than to ask that question. Let, but let, I want to give you... Let me make yeah, a statement. Yeah. I just finished a book, and it's my life message. And a lot of what I've just said is in this book. And the book's coming out February 21st, 2023. And the book is called Holy Awe. Mm. The Surprising Way the Fear of the Lord Transforms Your Life. Mm. And I hope with all my heart that every leader, every person that wants to be in ministry, and every person in the church reads this book. And I'm not saying it because I want a lot of book sales. I'm saying it because I really believe if we don't get this, our nation is lost. Mm. The only thing that can save our nation is a true revival from heaven, which will means the church comes alive. There's an awakening in the church. I believe that the fear of the Lord, if you look at the real root of every genuine revival, it's the fear of the Lord. I believe we need the authentic, holy fear of God back in the church. Mm. And that's what this book's about, and I hope people read it. Wow. Because I want to see pastors preaching it everywhere. I want to see believers living it everywhere. Amazing. Amazing. Well, John, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. 